Good afternoon, everyone. God bless your hearts. Uh, it's good to have an opportunity to address you again. Looking forward to getting back to service um, <clears throat> with you. Right now, it does look like that uh, our Governor Hutchison is um, uh, going to remove the restriction for for churches, as well as uh, I think he's going to remove the restaurants. I think they will be required six foot spacing between tables um, and barber shops and salons and and uh, among some other things. I think so. They're working towards removing some of these restrictions of mitigation. Anyway, um, let's keep praying for our legal officials. You know, I'm, I, uh, I've read a lot of things and both sides of all of this. And uh, it, is, it, it is interesting. It, it seems, you know, in some ways that there's uh, quite a bit of hype involved in it. But then on the other hand, I do understand that it is important Someone, I wish someone would look up for me. I heard that Switzerland did not do the mitigation the way that we're doing it, that they only mitigated the elderly and the sick at places like nursing homes and, and uh, guarded in hospitals and things like that. And, uh, but they did not shut down businesses and other things. And I hear, I'd have to do some research on them, but I hear that they've already developed, uh, their immune system has developed in what they call herd immunity, where, you know, if you are exposed, you'll develop immunity against some of these things. Anyway, it's, it is interesting. It's a part of a world history that we've never went through. And so we'll, it's always easier to look behind you than it is in the, in the, in the, future. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I, I do hope that we're getting close to getting back to uh, normal. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to welcome everyone today and say uh, I miss being in service with you. And, and as of right, the way things look right now, we will have service um, Mother's Day, May the 10th. And um, we probably will, uh, I didn't mention it Thursday night, but we probably will uh, have a service on Wednesday. What is that, the 6th, I believe, Wednesday night at 7.30. We'll probably do that. And I'll announce that we are going to have a work day on the Saturday the 9th to the brethren. <clears throat> and some of the sisters could some just come and make sure that you know, the church is clean and, and uh, you know, that we're ready to start back in services. We will not have breakfast or Bible study uh, on the 10th. We'll just have 1130 service. Um, by the way, we do have our uh, new awning in the front drive through awning, and we also placed an awning over the, the small entrance area by the nursery. Uh, so, and it looks really good. And so I'm thankful that we've got that done. Uh, I may say some, something to you today a little bit about the body of Christ. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, a little bit in back uh, drop concerning the body of Christ. And one of the reasons that I wanted to address this is because uh, I, we have several people watching uh, that may not have heard all these things. And so uh, anyway, uh, we've got people from other countries watching and, and uh, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Dominican Republic is pretty much uh, shut down. Uh, uh, I mean, they can get around from six in the morning to five in the afternoon, but they are uh, 
picked up by the police if they found out after five o'clock in the evening and, and there's not hardly anyone working. So I wanna thank everyone that has sent in uh, um, you know, uh, uh, missionary offerings. Uh, we received some missionary offerings this past week and have some before that. <clears throat> and I wanna thank everyone because uh, as soon as we received those offerings, I got offerings to the pastors over there and had them. We had some people say they hadn't eaten like four days and, uh, you know, they were hungry. And so we got some bean, beans and rice money to them anyway. It's good to see you, Sister Layton. I do intend to have keep the Thursday night Bible studies up. Um, anyway, uh, in mentioning some about the body of Christ, um, I, I just, you know, um, I'll, I'll say this about the history. Uh, of course, you read in the, in the Bible, you know, about the, by, the body and, and Jesus being the head of the body. And, of course, almost everybody in Christianity is using that term now, body of Christ, and calling themselves a part of the body of Christ. But if you go back to the early church, um, there was just one body. Um, in fact, if you want to turn to the fourth chapter, and let me say this to the people in, in our church, um, you might say, well, you know, I've heard this before, Bill Smith. Well, can you explain it to others? Can you, you know, that's why I think you ought to get your Bibles out and take notes and rehearse these things to a point that you can help others uh, in their understanding. And so, um, you know, it's important that you get it. Uh, what did Peter say? He said, I, I uh, how did he say? He said, I'm, it, he didn't bother him to put people in remembrance of the things that they already had heard. You know, he, he, he went, he re, uh, hurt, uh, rehearse things more than once. I find that myself. I get a greater understanding. The more I talk on certain subjects, the greater understanding I have of it and the better I can explain it. So anyway, I'll read this, uh, just the beginning of Ephesians 4 to you. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And here he's showing, you know, the body of Christ was especially uh, newer to the Gentiles that Paul was the apostle of, the Gentile people. And so they were having to practice, you know, humility, meekness, and, um, uh, you know, I think probably one of the best uh, definitions of meekness is a lack, uh, not no resistance, not to put up any resistance, a yielding spirit, uh, not to, you know, to be able, and then he coupled that with saying to have long suffering, forbearing one another in love. In other words, everybody's not going to agree. Everybody's mindset's not the same and everyone isn't going to agree on on things alike, and therefore we have to learn how to bear with each other, and and uh, realize that uh, we may not be able to see everything uh, the same, especially in our beginning of walking together in in the faith. And um, then he said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, and. Uh, you know, for me to have peace, and that's endeavoring to keep the unity of your spirit and my spirit, us working together and and keeping our spirits right towards each other, even if we don't agree on something or, you know, have a, uh, a misunderstanding of one another, we still have to remain in the spirit of humility, meekness, and uh, forbearing one another. And, uh, but then he says, 
that is to bring peace. If the 34th chapter of Psalms, I believe it is, says um, to seek peace. Uh, if you want to, I'm going to hold my place and just read that to you to make sure. I mean, I want you to... Uh, Here's what it says. It says, depart uh, from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So you have to, you know, peace isn't something that just comes automatic. You have to work at it. You have to work at that in a marriage. <laughs> you have to work at it in friendship. You have to work at it on a job, learning how to get along with your uh, employer or your boss, um, you know, uh, a lot of people don't understand this about the order of God. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they'll use that scripture, you know, where uh, uh, the head of every man is Christ. And so some people think, you know, I don't need to listen to anybody. It's just, you know, Christ. Uh, I have to pay attention to what Christ tells me. Well, number one, you don't know what Christ tells you all the time. Now, let's just be honest about it. It, it takes a long time of working with God to really understand when the Lord's talking to you and when it's your own mind. And uh, and he does have a ministry, and the Bible tells us to obey the ministry. And so to understand God's order, I a lot of times explain it this way and telling people that, you know, uh, if you're working for a big corporation, there's a CEO uh, that is chief executive officer. That's what CEO stands for. He's, in other words, he's in charge of the company. He may be the owner, uh, but you may not even know him as an employee because you may be, you may not be directly under him as a general manager or a supervisor or, or a, a department head or whatever. You may you may be working in an area where you've never even met the CEO, but he is the head. He's the head of that corporate, and he's your head. But the way his headship works is. He delegates authority, and God does that. God delegated authority to Jesus. Jesus delegated authority to the apostles. Apostles delegated authority to the other ministers that worked under them, and they delegated authority to deacons and, and to faithful people in the church. It goes all the way down to women delegating authority to their older children over the younger children. So... Just because Jesus is the head doesn't mean that you've got a relationship only with him. You've got a relationship with his operation. You've got op uh, with his, uh, uh, I started to say organization. I don't like using that word sometimes because uh, all of the different organizations of Christianity, they're not in order with God, but he, it is organized. It's an organized order. Anyway, uh, and, and so, but let me get back. Uh, I'm just showing that you have to seek peace. You have to pursue it at times. You have to work on it, work, work on it. Um, but then if I go back to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, in the fourth verse, it says, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. And that one body and then one spirit, there that that's not talking about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That's talking about the spirit of the body, which is Christ. It's the spirit of Christ. The body of Christ will have the head's spirit if they follow after him. The spirit that was in Christ will be taken on by the his body, his church. And uh you ought to be able to feel a different spirit when you go into different types of churches in Christianity I'm talking about. And so <clears throat> uh, you never heard about the body of Christ back in during the dark ages of the Gentile world. At least you can't find any, you can't find any resources that will take you back showing there was history utilizing that term uh, it might have been 
briefly mentioned in reading a scripture or whatever, but it wasn't elaborated on because uh, especially after the Reformation started and different organizations began to form, uh, it was divided and separated and it still is today. And so <clears throat> it's, it is necessary to understand that there was a falling away of the church. We, we make that statement quite a bit, but people who never heard that may have a, a difficult time understanding that. And uh, of course we use scriptures, if you turn to the uh, first John, uh, I believe it's in the fourth chapter of the, the epistle of first John where John starts off in the first verse and says, Beloved, believe not every spirit and try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Remember, one of the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation was is that it showed that that church had tried false apostles or tried apostles and found out that they were false. A church needs to develop to a place where they understand who is a true man of God in the body of Christ and who is not. And that takes development to understand that. I mean, I've heard people even in the body talking about men who are utilizing scripture that's totally wrong and them agreeing with it. And they can't, they can't judge rather what they're hearing is truth of the word of God it takes time to develop to that place that you understand the difference between truth and falsehood. Here John was showing, and this is the apostle John, and, and this was in the latter part of the Jewish world uh, before that world ended when, you know, he is, he is stating to try, don't believe every spirit. And he calls those spirits prophets. See, for they... Uh, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Um, so he's he's showing that there are men that are teaching things that are wrong. I'm talking about back there in the end of that world. And he was he was showing that the church see they didn't have that problem in the beginning. Those pos those apostles was able to shut the mouths of gainsayers. But now the apostles are passing off the scene. John saw the church falling. Uh, if you turn to Acts, look what Paul said. Is that the 19th chapter? Um, it's in the 20th chapter, I'm sorry, uh, where Paul told the elders at Ephesus, I look in the 27th verse. He said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I'm, I, I would love to get to that place that I could tell the church, I have not shunned to tell you all of God's counsel. I'm working on it, and it'll probably be a younger ministry than me when we have a restored church that can give you all of God's counsel without any error or without any misunderstanding in it. Look what he said in verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. They're not just they're not just men that's, you know, just going to come in from the outside, but there's men among you that are going to begin to change some of this counsel and truths of God's word, not sparing the flock. Also, he goes on and says, uh, uh, yeah, verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. 
Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you, warn everyone night and day with tears. Um, and this is the last time he tells them they won't see his face anymore. He says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word, word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So <clears throat> Paul was warning those men. He knew the church was going to fall away. Let, you know, I know the church here has heard me say it over and over and over. And I, I'll, I'll probably continue to say it because I don't want you ever to not know or understand this, why the church fell away in the Gentile age. Um, <clears throat> and I know it sounds like a broken record, but for those of y'all who hadn't heard me mention it before, the, the, uh, you have to understand that God, God started out with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, and of course, Jacob and a uh, little uh, inheritance of Jacob wound up under Joseph in Egypt. And God worked on those people. Uh, he, even, he even declared, he even told Abraham, wasn't it, that they would be in, in slavery for 430 years. <laughs> it, God put that little people there but he had to put them in a, in a condition where he could humble them and then deal with them and, and, and let them develop. They had to develop uh, in more than 70 souls. They had to develop when Egypt, uh, when Israel left Egypt, there was probably a million or more people. And that was probably just counting the men and boys. Uh, when they went across the the desert and the wilderness, uh, there were well over a million people, maybe up toward around three million estimated. Uh, that was a great group of people that God had developed, getting them ready to become a nation uh, that would uh, that He would work with and finally bring them to a place where he could send Christ to this world and reconcile fallen man back to himself. That took God 2,000 years of working with the Jews to accomplish that. Uh, we often say it takes, you know, that, that uh, as Peter said, a thousand years with the Lord is as a, uh, a, uh, a day and a day is as a, th a year and a year is as a thousand years. Um, and of course we'll take, you know, each day of God's creation, he created everything in six days and rested the seventh. And so we take those as thousand year days that in 6,000 years, God will have, uh, finished his work. Uh, and, and the seventh day or the millennium man will enter into his rest. And so uh, uh, God, God worked 2,000 years from, from Adam until uh, Moses and from, from, and, a, and from Abraham to Christ was 2,000 years. And so, and those were 2,000 year days, or two days, two uh, two 1,000 year days. And, and, uh, and uh, when Jesus came, it was in the 4,000th four, four year. That's why they, Lazarus, God let him stay uh, dead and in the grave for four days before he allowed Jesus to resurrect him. It was a picture to show that life through Christ would come after these four days or 4,000 years. And so, uh, uh, the the Gentiles, you know, when when God started with the Apostle Paul with the Gentiles, it, of course it started with Peter in the house of Cornelius, but um, uh, then the Apostle Paul was called to be over them because Peter's job was over the over the Jewish nation, 
with the other 11 apostles. And so the apostle Paul began to plant the gospel among the Gentiles. And what you have to understand is, is that the Gentiles that were able to come in back there under that new covenant, uh, that was just a few. This thing was to reach out into the whole world of Gentiles. And they didn't have the backdrop or the platform of, uh, that Israel had for 2,000 years of God dealing with them, God uh, 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 not only the history that God uh, developed Israel under, but also the law and the prophets, the law of Moses and the prophets that God worked on those people for 2,000 years and got them finally ready that a remnant of them would receive Christ. And uh, and then when God began to work with the Gentiles, he started out with a brand new people. The church had to fall down on a more primitive, lower level of people understanding what this new covenant was all about. Because Paul and the apostles, Paul, Peter, John, James, the four uh, uh, gospel writers, uh, the book of Acts, they wrote that. The big part of it was written out of scripture of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. So for Gentiles to get to a place that they could receive what was received, let's see, can you repeat or someone help us out? Adam to Moses was 2,000 years. Then was it Abraham to Jesus? So the timeline. Uh, let's see what that says. Let's see, I can't click on that, but Yes, uh, if I've got it right, someone can can, re can look it up. But I believe it was about 2,000 years from Adam until Moses, and, and which uh, that's when the law of God started. And then from, from the covenant he made with Abraham until Christ was 2,000 years. I believe it was about 1,500 years from Moses on. Someone may want to look that up. You can post it. I'm just talking off of you know, memory in my mind, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty close. Um, then, um, and, and so all I'm trying to show is, is that that, uh, how that it took God 2,000 years to get the, the Jewish world ready. And I don't know how anyone could think it would take less than that for the Gentiles to get ready. They were brand new uh, type of people, our back, our uh, our our uh, history as Gentiles. If you go back to our forefathers, you know they were worshippers of idols, false gods. Uh, they were without God. They didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, they may have had some history, or, but they didn't have any real knowledge. And uh, God hadn't groomed them. God started working with that Gentile church back there in the early church and has worked all the way down through uh, the dark ages. The, the Catholic church actually started in AD 325, or I mean, I know they say it started back with Peter, but <laughs> I'm talking about when, it, when it was actually formed and Constantine put the Pope in, in power and it began to rule the world for 1260 years from from five, it took to five thirty eight to seventeen ninety eight was that ruling period, uh, and so, uh, and then when you look at the Catholic Church and look at the New Testament, there is, uh, there's no comparison in the two churches. What you read about, I remember talking to my wife after I was a young man. God had called me to the ministry, and I was reading the Bible. And I, one night I was up and sitting up in bed reading. My poor wife was in bed asleep. I woke her up and I said, listen to this. I said, there's no church like this anywhere in the world. <laughs> I was so elated by what I was reading about. And I had read and heard about it all my life from a child. But there were just things that was coming alive to me on the pages of scripture. And so... Uh, 
So the Gentile church, as I showed you in 1 John 4, where he said, don't believe every spirit for many false prophets that went out. I read to you in Acts 20 here, where Paul told the, the disciples at Ephesus, he said, men of your own selves are gonna rise up and they're going to deceive many, drawing disciples away of them own selves. Uh, that's something that man has to work towards. Man has to work to the point that they're not this is not my church. It, they're not my people. They're God's people. And yes, I may be an overseer of a certain group of people, but we are not to plant our own seed of the word of God or our ideology in man's hearts, but we're to plant the truth of the word of God. That's a picture in, in Joseph wasn't allowed to touch Mary until the baby Jesus was born. That baby was to be born of God. And that was a picture in type that each one of us that are born again, not only of the spirit, but of the word of God, have to be born of the seed of God, of God's true word. And man's ideology is not to enter in it. That's called leaven. It's falsehood, and, and we cannot, we're going to have to develop in a restored church where there is only a ministry that is preaching the word of God, and when God has a restored church, it'll be one word, and there will just be one body. I was going to say earlier, uh, I'll use one more scripture, and I'm going to say something about William Souders and in 2 Thessalonians, and this is Paul, of course, writing, writing to uh, the church in Thessalonica, which is a Gentile church. And uh, of course, he tells them concerning the coming of the Lord, uh, uh, that, and, and here he's talking 2,000 years ago to a church back then. And, and he tells them in verse three, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, speaking of the coming of the Lord, he, he mentions that in the, in the first two scriptures. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man uh, of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Well, um, so <clears throat> it, he's showing them that there's going to be a falling away of the church. And, and you couple that with scriptures, like I mentioned in first John four, that many false prophets have gone out into the world where Paul told the, uh, in the 20th chapter of Acts, where Paul told the, the, uh, disciples at Ephesus that, that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, spoiling the flock. And he said, men of your own selves will rise up uh, and uh, making disciples of them own selves. Uh, and so they were showing clearly that the church was gonna fall away back then. And then of course, uh, if you take, uh, if you, if you take, uh, like for an example, the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. And you can turn there, but I'm gonna say this before we uh, say anything about that. I wanted to mention how that uh, the first history that we really have of a man preaching about the body of Christ and what it was, was William Souders back in the early 1900s. God called this man and uh, put it in his heart, and and uh, many of you have heard where you know he was preaching with a great anointing, and he really uh, was you know God called him. He was really green as a preacher, but God was touching him, and uh, but he made friends with other preachers, and uh, got saved in a revival, and and. Uh, later received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and uh, he, he became he friends with, with other ministers that he knew and, uh, and became acquainted with. And 
some of those preachers finally got him aside and said, well, you're going to have to stop preaching some of the things you're preaching. Because it, and he said, why? And they said, because it's not right. He said, well, how is it? So they began to tell him what was the common teaching or understanding about certain things that he was saying. And so, of course, he wanted to be liked and he began to conform and, and do what he was hearing them say he ought to do. After he did it, it wasn't very long he realized he lost his anointing. And he was praying one day and he asked God, he said, God, where's my anointing? Why have you took my anointing away? And he said, God spoke to him and said, because I called you to preach my gospel. When God called him, that's what he told him. He said, he heard a voice that said, I've called you, William Souders, to, to preach my gospel. And he said, there was such a great emphasis on my that he was astounded by that and never forgot it. And when the Lord was uh, correcting him here, he said, I called you to preach my gospel and you're preaching man's gospel. And he said, I've, I said, God, if you give me my anointing back, I'll preach it however you give it to me, no matter what. And he began to preach the word of God the way that God gave it to him and that anointing came back. And one of the things that he realized was, was this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians that, uh, that uh, where he read, there's just one body. And he began to study about the body of Christ. And, and he began to just look naturally at a body, how it was just one, it was all connected. The human body's all connected. If you cut my hand off, my hand's no, more, no longer part of my body. And, and if ministers make up organizations and different secular groups and they're separate from one another, there's no way that can be one body. There's many bodies today, saints. God is going to call his people back to one body. In, in the Jewish world, there was even more than one body among the Jews. There was Sadducees, Pharisees. See, there were secular groups separated. And there were Essenes, there was Herodians, there was Elamites, there they had there were different secular groups back there but when the lord began to call people through his apostles after the day of pentecost he called them into one body there wasn't different beliefs there wasn't different ideologies of man but he began to give them the truth and they all preached the same thing and we're going to have to get back to that if we're going to have what the early church had and accomplish what they com accomplished, that's what we're going to have to have. We're built on the law and the prophets and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. We have to line up to Jesus' teachings and the teachings that was given out by him through his apostles in that early church. And so uh, that was important. Uh, it's important for you and I to understand. Uh, Brother Souders, he began to preach and he opened his doors to all of God's people. He didn't segregate. He didn't, he didn't separate. But if you was a man of God, he opened the doors. And uh, if you was a child of God, you could come to Brother Souders' meetings. He had an open door. In fact, back then, some of the churches were called open door churches. He even opened the pulpit and let men uh, of different ideals, of different teachings that came from different areas of, of uh, organizations. He let them all, he would, he, would, he would give freedom for them to talk in the pulpit. Eventually it developed to where they said, well, anyone can talk in the pulpit, but we, we do deserve the right to can't to question one another because he began to tell 
how important it was that we work towards one faith. See, that scripture I read you in first in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it starts off saying, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. But if you read on into the chapter, he finally gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. He said, until we all come to the unity of the faith, we all got to come to one faith. In fact, he says that in the beginning of the chapter where it says there is one body and one spirit, one hope where you're called, one hope of your calling. And then he says that there is one Lord and one faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So there's just one true word of God. There's not all this different ideology. And, uh, but we've got men, see men in the, in the religious world have forgot that and just, you know, this is my, uh, this is the way we teach it. And the other one here, this is the way we teach it. Isaiah said in the, you know, that finally there's going to be seven women take a hold of one man. We always teach that that's talking about seven different, uh, which is the number of, of completeness, seven, all. All the different organizations are going to take hold of one man. And he'll be the leader. He'll, he'll carry an umbrella. But it said, they'll say, and, and the reason they'll do that is to take away our approach approach is that we've been divided and separated. At some point, there's going to be all of Christianity is going to come together and call that the body. But they're going to say, but let us eat our own bread or have our own doctrine. Let us wear our own apparel or have our own organizational names and, and set up. But let us be called by your name as the umbrella to take away our approach. So, and then, uh, so somewhere there has to be a unity of the faith. And that's been lost in the majority of Christianity. And we've got to get back. We've got to get back to uh, a place to where we're seeking for God's will and the truth of God's word in its entirety. I am not willing, for one, I'm not willing to settle on this side of Jordan. I'm not willing, and what that means is I'm not willing to just settle where we are. God's blessed us immensely, I know that. But I'm not willing to settle for where we're at. I know there's more. I know God has more for his people and I know more has to be accomplished for us to do the will of God. So, uh, we have to keep working at it. Uh, let me work a little bit more on the falling away. In the 11th chapter of the book of, of Revelations, uh, I, I'm not going to go to the 6th chapter, which shows the, the seals of the, of the, starts off with the four horses. Uh, most of our people know what the, those seals represent. I'll just quickly say the white horse with the rider, with a bow in his hand going forth, conquering into conquer is a picture of Jesus Christ, the rider of the horse. Zechariah, uh, the fourth chapter, other, there's uh, Joel, the second chapter, it'll show you that prophecy, horses are prophets, prophetical terms for the church, symbols. And the horse, the white is, is a picture of purity or righteousness. And that early church back there was a white horse. It was a pure, righteous people. And Jesus was the rider of the horse. He was the head of that body. And, and he was going forward, conquering, and to conquer in righteousness through truth. But then the horse turned red, which is the color of sin. And the rider of that horse changed. The rider of that horse had a sword in his hand and he was given power to hurt men. That's a picture of 
the Pentecostal era. The church fell out of the righteous divine order of God and sin entered in and men still had the word of God and had power. The word of God's powerful. Knowledge of the word of God is powerful, but if you don't have wisdom to know how to use it, it's not, it's, it's not right to use it incorrectly. And that's why they had power to hurt man. We're in a Pentecostal, we're in the Pentecostal era right now. Uh, and uh, we're still having to realize that it, if we're not careful, we're gonna hurt God's people. I, I know you know, I'm getting to be an older man. I, I don't, you know, I don't like it. When you get in your 70s, years sooner, you're going to have to acknowledge that I'm not a young man anymore. Um, my mama died at 95, and she said, you're just as young as you feel. So if she is here, I'd just say, well, mama, I'm trying to feel young. <laughs> but I, you know what I mean. I, I know that I am getting older in age. Um, anyway, uh, that you, I, I was going to say that I know when I was younger, I did, I was foolish and did not have wisdom as a minister of God. And I, I did hurt people. I thought I was doing right, but I didn't have the wisdom. And so you have to correct yourself as you go, but thank God we have a hope for a restored church and a leadership in an apostolic ministry that's going to have the wisdom that their only desire is to see the people of God go forth with a proper balance, with a proper judgment. And that judgment's not always bad judgment. You know, in fact, Dennis, for the church, I think most judgment's good judgment. You know, it's instruction. It's it's information that gives us good instruction in righteousness. And then there's correction and there's chastisement if need be. But God is long suffering. He's gentle. He's peaceable. He's easy to be untreated. That's wisdom from above, James said. So, uh, uh, you know, that red horse. And then, of course, the horse went to black. Black's color of darkness, ignorance. That's what happened. The church fell away. It went from white to red, a Pentecostal era, finally to darkness. And uh, darkness, and then it finally went to pale hooks where there was death, you know. I would say it went from a, a divine order of God to a Pentecostal era to a Protestant Protestant type era where there was still yet less information, less knowledge. And then there was death where there wasn't any anointing that, that dictated and ruled over God's people for 1260 years. We went through this world, Gentile world went through all of that. Then God finally found a man by the name of Martin Luther. He found men before that, Husk, Wycliffe, men that uh, were true-hearted, seeking after God, but they didn't live, God. they didn't get in a place that God could use them and, and cause them to actually march out, uh, out of the system. And God would begin to bless with a reformed message you know, Martin Luther's message mainly was the just shall live by faith. That was such a great message for people to find out that I don't have to live under rituals, but I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. Anyway, the church fell away and it's, it's being restored. Uh, when it started out, it started out in a black horse again, out of the, out of the pale horse. And then now we're, we, we were in a Pentecostal era for about 100 years. And I, now I think there's some white hairs getting into the, into the horse. I think we're headed back for a white horse. The 19th chapter of the book of Revelation shows that Jesus came riding on a white horse and they that were with him were on white horses. 
assemblies. Righteous people under the righteous order of God were developing back into. Now, in Revelation, the sixth chapter, um, I'm sorry, Revelation's the 11th chapter. I was just mentioning those four horses in the sixth chapter. Uh, of course, there were there's seven seals, but I'm, I just gave you the four uh, addressing this subject of the church falling away. Um, in Revelation 11, look at it, first verse. It said, there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, and what he's telling them was, measure it, get the measurements, get all this wrote down because it's, it's going to be tore up and it's going to have to be rebuilt. Somebody's going to have to have the measurements of knowing how to go back and build it in order. And what that's a picture of is, it's a picture of a ministry today looking at the early church and taking the pattern. Remember when God told Moses to build the tabernacle, he said, build it according to the pattern that was showed you. There's a pattern of the New Testament church under the covenant that Jesus Christ died and put in place the, the everlasting covenant for you and I. That's, that order of God has been lost down through the Gentile ages. Again, I just, want, I just want you to understand that when the Gentile world began to embrace this message, it was difficult. It was difficult for the church uh, of Gentiles to begin to come in and embrace this and get it on the same level that the Jews had gotten it because of the 2,000 year platform that, that they had. Even today, if you're a new Christian and you're not really, a, you, you, you know, your, your life hasn't been in church and you haven't been a student of the Bible, it'll take you some time to get the puzzle of God's word put together where you can understand what this is all about, what God's eternal purpose is. It's important, saints, for you to understand God's eternal purpose and what is going to bring that purpose about. There is a measurement in the word of God that shows us what produces what God wants in this restored church. So John told him, told, I mean, the angel told John, measure the temple and, and the altar and them that worship therein. That was that early church back there. But the court, which is without the temple, see the, the temple was an outer court, the inner place or holy, holy place, and then the holy of holies, three, three compartments to the, to the temple. The court outside, he said, leave it out. Don't measure that. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. 42 months and 30 year days is 40 times 30 days is 120. It's, that's 100, uh, 120 months. Uh, yeah, 120 days, uh, which represents uh, 1,260 years. Uh, uh, 42 months would be 60 days. So uh, anyway, it's 1,260 years prophetically that's talking about. And But you see there, by the time the church fell away, there wasn't anything but the outer court. The holy of holies and the holy place for the temple had, had been done away with. It had been lost. We don't have, we don't have, we don't have down through the dark ages, we haven't had the holy place and the holy of holies. It wasn't a place that you could in, enter into. It didn't exist. This is talking about a, a symbolic temple anyway. It's not a natural building made with hands, but this is a temple a spiritual temple made up of people. 
but they didn't have the order that held on to or was able to maintain a holy place or enter into the holy of holies itself where God and Jesus and the holy angels are. So we've been in a hole, we've been in the outer court and we tread that down. We, we didn't even know how to deal with the outer court properly. Not the pattern of the early church. And he said, I'll give power to my two witnesses and they'll prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. That 1,203 score days um, okay, from Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years. Thank you, Brother Carpio. It's been a while since I looked back at that. At that. I didn't want to make a statement that I wasn't sure about. Uh, so I guess he researched that for us. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. These two uh, witnesses. That's the Old and New Testament. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. In other words, the word of God is true and Without the true operation of the word of God and the spirit of God, you're, it, the word of God is going to, it's still judgment's going to come. Still, uh, the rain's not going to come on the earth or a move of the spirit of God if, if man's heart's not right towards God and doesn't operate according to God's word. It said, when they finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit will make war with them, against them, and that shall overcome them and kill them. In other words, kill the influence of these two witnesses, the Old and New Testament. And their dead bodies shall line the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. In other words, and that's talking spiritually, Sodom is a the uh, corruption of the intimate relationship that should be with Jesus Christ and Egypt, the world, having the world intimacy with the world, not with Jesus Christ in your relationship. And these two bodies, are witnesses, the Old and New Testament lay dormant and they of the people and Kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Three days and a half or three years and a half prophetically is, is 42 months or 1260 days or 1260 prophetical years. And they'll dwell upon the earth. They that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And the word of God will put you under conviction and torment when you're trying to do your own will, not the will of God, and then the word of God comes against you. So uh, these the, the Old and New Testament, uh, they rejoiced that they had no effect over the ideology of man's religious system in Christianity. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. I read that, verse 11. But then after, it, verse 11 says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, these two witnesses that lay dead in the streets. See, God wouldn't let them do away with the word of God. It may have been chained to a pulpit where no no everyday person could read it in Latin, but they didn't, God didn't let them do away with it. But after three, uh, three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on them that saw it. 
That's when the Reformation started, when God, the, the life began. God began to call men. It was time for the Reformation. God had finally got the Gentile world ready for the uh, Reformation to start. And the spirit of life entered in and caused and, and it caused them to, what well, it said, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And so there, the church was restored right there. And, and uh, that cloud, by the way, at some point I might talk a little bit on clouds. A lot of people think, you know, when Jesus comes back to gather up his bride, we're going to be caught up to cloud level. I hate, to, I hate to disappoint you if that's what your belief is, but that's not the way it's going to happen. That cloud is a restored church. Jesus is going to come sitting on a cloud. One likened, in the 14th chapter says, one likened to the Son of Man. John saw him on a cloud with a sickle in his hand. That cloud was the church. It's a restored church. I've told people in our church, you know, if the world is round, let me find something round. Here's a, here's a salt shaker. <laughs> Can I use this to help you? There's the world right there. Now, when Jesus came back literally and he came down to cloud level, well, let's say that right up here we are. Let's say this is the United States, but look at all these other nations over here. It's just seven miles on the sea where the horizon is. You can't see over the horizon as the church, I mean, as the world curves. If you're up here, you can only see seven miles. If the earth curves, you can't see down here. If Jesus came up to, down to cloud level here, people over here wouldn't even see. He's not coming in a natural cloud, saints. He's coming back in a restored church. He's first coming to his church to manifest himself fully and completely to this world, just like he did the early church. And he'll gather his people together in one body and make up the remainder of his bride. And then his bride will rule with him for a thousand years and finally clean up the rest of this world. Think about it. It's took God 4,000 years to get us to a place where the bride's been, been accomplished and, and made up but it's only going to take a thousand years. That sounds like a long time, but it's only going to take a thousand years to clean up the whole world and eternal eternity is going to be set up. The world's going to become like the Garden of Eden again. Hallelujah. The Lord himself is going to come down and dwell among us, the Bible says, in all sorrow, all suffering, no more tears, Praise God, I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to that. I'm not, I'm not wanting to go today because I know that I still have some things that needs to be accomplished. And I know the word of God shows that all of us in the church has things that must be accomplished. Let's be diligent. Soldiers in this army, you know, Solomon saw two armies or an army with two banners. That's the Old and New Testament. That's a Jew and Gentile church. Praise God. Well, I just wanted to recap a little bit, a little bit about the body of Christ, the falling away of the church, and showing that it needs to be and is going to be restored. I didn't get into much of the scriptures on restoration, but it did show you that the two witnesses life came back into them and people who saw it that said and 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 it said stand up on your feet the word of god has stood up in men of god that are working in this reformation to restore the church today hold on to that hope saints don't give up on that don't settle for uh, where we are in God, we're in a great place. We're blessed of God, but there's greater things in store. He's leading us on and he's showing us the way. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah, from 
Brother Carpio says from Abraham to Moses around 500. It's 1,500 years from Moses. That's what I was, I got that backwards. It's 1,500 years from Moses to Christ, but it's 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. How long was it from fallen Adam or from Adam to Abraham or Abraham or from Adam to Moses? Anyway, God bless your hearts. I'm looking forward uh, we will have another uh, session Thursday night at seven o'clock. I'm looking forward to getting back together with all of you at First Gospel Church here in Little Rock. And we will be, uh, I will, I'm planning on continuing this Thursday night, seven o'clock Bible study, maybe for a while. God bless all your hearts. I want to just say, I want to thank all the saints and Again, in in uh, Little Rock First Gospel Church for your financial support during this time, mailing in your tithes and offerings, it's kept the church supported and kept us going financially. I, I want you to know how much I really appreciate your faithfulness. And then those of you in the church and even in other areas that have mailed us missionary offerings, our missionary work in the Dominican Republic has suffered greatly because of this uh, pandemic that's going on. And many of them, um, a big part of them cannot work. The work is shut down. Many of them are hungry and every everything, I'm trying to get them money and help them as much as I possibly can to make sure that they at least have food to eat if it's just rice and beans. Thank you again for your offerings that we, we just received offerings this week. Received offerings from Brother brother John Wright out in California, Brother uh, uh, brother Maine, uh, different ones, different of you ministers that sent us, sent us offerings. Uh, uh, we're so thankful. Canada, Keswick, they just, Brother Goss just sent us a, a nice offering for the missionary funds. And I want you to know we have put that money in the hands of pastors over there and trying to get them food. Remember to pray for our needs uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, I won't mention them here today because I'm running a little over time, but God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Uh, I'll talk to you again Thursday night at seven o'clock. And uh, in our church, I always end a service normally by telling people to shake hands and be friendly. And you shouldn't be shaking hands right now, but you know how they do? They just shake their hands like this. <laughs> so shake hands and be friendly. God bless you. I'll see you next time.